So today we're going to look at the narrative view of personal identity. Uh, to put it simply, the narrative view claims that personal identity is determined by the stories that we tell ourselves of our own lives. Uh, we interpret our current actions and feelings in light of a uh, story about our past and uh, potential future. You know, suppose somebody asks, who are you? Well, how would you respond to that? Well, perhaps by telling a story you know, about where you come from, about your goals and interests, about your beliefs, about your hopes for the future, and so on. In order to explain exactly who I am, I need to tell a story of my life. Perhaps that's because, in some sense, I literally am the story of my life. So, uh, let's get into this in a bit more detail. Uh, in philosophy, this, this view is most famously defended by Daniel Dennett in his paper, uh, the self as a center of narrative gravity. Now, Dennett is something of a nihilist uh, about the self. Remember that nihilism is the claim that there are no selves. What Dennett says is that uh, selves are fictions, or more specifically, they're theoretical abstractions. Consider centers of gravity. We appeal to centers of gravity to help us get about in the world, and not just within physics, but within everyday life. If you try to balance an object, let's say you try to balance a pen, you can tell which way the pen is going to fall, and you can use that to help you get it to a point where it will stay standing. You're using the pen's centre of gravity to help you manipulate the pen. Or if we view a double-decker bus, which uh, takes a corner and tips over, we might ask, why did the bus tip, tip over? And somebody might say, well, there are a load of heavy things in the upper part of the bus, so its centre of gravity is too high. Here, we're appealing to centres of gravity in our causal explanations. So centres of gravity, you know, the, we, we use them and we appeal to them in uh, causal explanations. And But despite this, a centre of gravity uh, isn't a thing in the world. Uh, it has no mass, no colour, no charge. Indeed, it has no intrinsic physical properties at all. The only physical property it seems to have is spatiotemporal location. If we were to ask, what is the weight or the charge of an object's centre of gravity? Well, we'd be making a category mistake. Because centres of gravity are abstractions, they're theoretical fictions. Now, they're fictions with a very useful and uh, clearly defined role in physics, but they are fictions all the same. So, uh, the thought then is, well, the physicist is confronted with various objects exhibiting various kinds of behaviour, and the physicist must uh, interpret those objects, and to do so he comes up with this abstraction of uh, a centre of gravity. Well, similarly, we are confronted with various organic things exhibiting different kinds of behaviour, and these must also be interpreted. Selves are theoretical fictions which help us do this. Each person has a self, and this can explain and predict their behaviour, just as each person has a centre of gravity, which helps to explain and predict aspects of their behaviour. Okay, so what is exactly is this self? Well, the brain is an extremely complex uh, uh, engine. It consists of a variety of uh, independent, sometimes competing modules, which have been bundled together over millions of years of evolution. Different parts evolved at different times. We have a visual area, an auditory area, we have areas dealing with emotional regulation, areas for language production and comprehension, areas involved in social coordination, areas for memory processing. We have higher cognitive areas that we use when engaged in more sophisticated forms of reflection and reasoning. Activity in the brain is distributed across these many different regions, and most of them operate largely independently of each other. Now, people often assume that there must be some part of the brain wherein all of this activity is, is kind of unified or brought together in a single place. But actually, this is, this is just false. There is no central theatre of the brain. Instead, Dennett suggests, it is the stories we tell ourselves of our own lives that makes this uh, chaotic, often disunified activity of our brains comprehensible to us. The story gives us the illusion of unity. So the, the notion of the self as, as a kind of protagonist in this story of our own lives, uh, this is a theoretical construction that provides unity to our thoughts, feelings, intentions, memories, behaviour and so on. Now, an important clarification is uh, important here. Uh, the brain spins narratives 
and these constitute the self. This is not to say that the self is the brain or that the self is part of the brain. Then it uh, draws an analogy to Herman Melville's book Moby Dick. The book opens with the line, call me Ishmael. Now obviously it's a mistake to think that Melville is Ishmael. Melville is the author, Ishmael is a fictional character. So similarly, the human brain is an author of these various narratives, selves are characters in those narratives. And this is why Dennett emphasises that selves are, are kinds of fiction. Uh, if you go looking in the brain to find the self, you've made a category mistake, just like somebody who asks, what is the weight of a centre of gravity? The most we can say is that if there are three human bodies on a park bench, then in normal circumstances at least, there will be three selves on a park bench. But the self is not the brain. The brain is rather the author of these narratives. And, and the self is uh, the, the sort of central character in those narratives. And that's what your personal identity ultimately amounts to, is, is a, a kind of character in, in a narrative spun by the brain. Now, Dennett notes that this view of personal identity seems to, uh, it seems well suited to capture cases like dissociative identity disorder, which we discussed in the last video. Uh, after all, in principle, it seems entirely possible that there could be more than one uh, centre of narrative gravity per body. The brain could generate non-overlapping centres, uh, non-overlapping non sets of narratives, um, and that is what happens in multiple personality cases, according to Dennett. So uh, it might be worth uh, sort of trying to get a bit clear about what exactly is a narrative. Um, so according to one view by Peter Lamarck, uh, a narrative involves a sequence of events where various events are unified by non-logical relations, so that the events of one time are interpreted in lights of, uh, or they derive their meaning from, the events of another time. And this is what distinguishes narratives from uh, mere conjunctions of events. So I might say, for instance, uh, I went to the cinema and I went to the beach and I ate dinner and I read a book, and so on. That's not a narrative, that's just a list. It's just a a kind of conjunction of things I did. It becomes a narrative only when we relate the events to each other. Here's a good example from uh, Mariah Schechtman. Suppose that Frank is a student and he's uh, grinding away at a low-paying, very hard job in order to help him pay for university. He's doing very well at university and he has every reason to expect that within a year or so he'll be able to move on to a much better career. On the other hand, consider Vincent. He's doing the same job as Frank but he's spent his life in bad jobs, and he's a single father because his wife recently died. Um, and let's say as well that he, uh, you know, he, th he thought a couple of months ago it looked like things were going to improve, and he thought he was going to be able to get a better job, but then that fell through and he's had to go back to this, this bad job, right? So things are very bad for Vincent. Now, Sheckman suggests that even though Frank and Vincent do exactly the same work, it has very different meanings because it's placed in a different narrative. For Frank, the job is perhaps seen as a kind of rite of passage. It's like the hard work you have to put in before you get the reward of the, you know, the better career. Now, for Vincent, it's something, it's something very different, of course. It's a very different narrative, and so the job has a very different meaning. Here's maybe another example, so you can sort of see the idea. Let's say that 10 years ago, I witnessed somebody being bullied terribly, and I I, I don't speak up about it. Um, you know, I just sit there and, and let the bullying continue. So I, I did the wrong thing and I feel guilty about it. Five years later, in a similar scenario, I remember my previous failure and this time I do speak out. Now on the narrative view, these events are part of a story, a kind of redemption story. The later event where I do help is related to the early earlier event in a special kind of way. If the order of those events was swapped so that uh, first I do the right thing and then I do the wrong thing, well clearly the story would be very different uh, and each event would have a, a different meaning in the, the in the context of that different story. One of the um, benefits of the narrative view is that it seems quite well placed to capture the way in which certain things are central to our identities. So philosophy is central to me, right? And I might spend less time on philosophy than other things. So if I run out of money, maybe I'll have to get a job working in a hotel. And I might spend more time working at the hotel than doing philosophy. 
Still, the hotel is not important to me. It doesn't feature centrally in my narrative in the way that philosophy does. Philosophy is a huge part of my past. My pursuit of philosophy explains how I got to where I am. It's central in my, in my plans for the future as well, because I want to be a philosopher. Much of what I do is focused on achieving that. The hotel, on the other hand, is just a, it's just a way to make money, even if I, you know, in, in terms of pure time, even if I spend more time doing it. A couple of other points about narratives. First, narratives are constructed, they are not discovered. So this means that personal identity is, is actually something that we do. It's an active creation. It's not just something that's kind of given at birth. We, we actively cre create pers our personal identity. Um, and, and so this is, I, I guess, maybe sort of, you can sort of see, that, see then it's claim that selves are in some sense fictions. You know, they're constructed, created things. On the other hand, it's not something that we can uh, sort of avoid doing. We are all brought up as language users and we can't help telling stories about ourselves and others. We just it, sort of immediately start engaging in interpretations of ourselves and others from very early, very early on in life. It, it, we're just naturally inclined to do it. And, you know, we, we really can't avoid it. It's not it's not it's not possible to to avoid, at least according to the narrativist. Second, narratives are heavily influenced by social context. Um, and this means that different societies may construct personal identity in different ways. We saw in the last video that the ancient Greeks arguably had a radically different view of what persons of what persons are. And the narrative theory can explain this. It's simply that the ancient Greeks told different kinds of stories. Now, Mariah Schechtman points out that there are two constraints that any uh, self-narrative must follow. First, there is the articulation constraint. This says that a person must be able to express their narrative to others. They must be able to answer basic questions, such as, uh, how did you come to be in this place? Or, why did you choose that course of action? Or, where will you go next? Or, what is your educational background and how has it helped you in your current job? and so on. Now this doesn't mean obviously that a person must give their whole life story when asked. Indeed probably mo most of the time we don't we, we don't want to bore others with extended discussions of our lives. The point is just that we have to recognize that certain questions are legitimate and in general we have to be able to ask uh, have to be able to answer them. It's legitimate to ask somebody, you know, why did you choose to do that? Because persons have reasons for their actions and they can sort of relate those reasons to you know, their, desire, their desires and so on. And, you know, we have to be able to answer these sorts of questions. Second uh, is the reality constraint. And this says that uh, self-narratives must be accurate in certain uh, important respects. The narrative I tell must not be in conflict with basic facts about the world, uh, or my body, or my psychological characteristics. Now, it's obvious why we need this constraint. You can't just tell any story you want. It would be ridiculous for me to claim, for example, that I'm an alien from Neptune. Uh, and, and remember, you know, that the point of narrative selves, as Dennett says, is to help us predict and explain observed behaviours, and it's to help us make you know, the activity of our brains comprehensible. If we accepted just any narrative as legitimate, it would be useless as a theoretical tool. Treating me as though I'm an alien from Neptune would not be useful at all in explaining or predicting my behaviour. In fact, it would cause all sorts of other problems since if we if we seriously thought that I was an alien from Neptune, we'd have to you know, alter many other aspects of modern science. So we, we have to reject uh, some narratives. We have to reject any narrative that clearly violates um, obvious facts. In discussing the reality constraint, Schechtman imagines a person, let's call him Vincent, who claims to be Napoleon. The worry is that if Vincent tells the right kind of narrative, a narrative that includes, for example, losing the Battle of Waterloo, then the narrative theory will force us to conclude that Vincent really is Napoleon. That, of course, is absurd. Uh, Schechtman thinks that this would constitute a reductio of the narrative theory. Uh, the reality constraint is designed to deal with this problem. Schechtman says that Vincent must make serious mistakes about reality, uh, and I quote, he will need to deny facts about what year it is, what objects are around him, around him, what happens to human bodies over time, and so on. Since we know that Napoleon died in 1821, Vincent will need to deny the obvious fact that it is currently 2016. 
since we know that cars did not exist in Napoleon's time and that horses were the primary vehicle of transport, Vincent will need to say that there are no cars and that everybody rides horses. Vincent makes obvious and serious mistakes about easily observed facts, and this means that his Napoleon narrative violates the reality constraints, so we can reject his claim that he is Napoleon. We will return to this point uh, in just a minute. So, let's consider uh, some objections. Well, first of all, on the narrative view, it seems to follow that babies and animals have no personal identity. Personal identity, uh, on this view, requires sophisticated cognitive capacities. We probably don't start telling narratives about ourselves until, uh, I mean, at least f f three or four years at the earliest. So, are we going to say that infants and animals just you know, don't have any kind of personal identity? That seems kind of absurd. I mean, obviously, they don't have the capacities for reflection and rationality that uh, human adults do, but they do seem to have rudimentary selves. Both infants and animals seem to understand the distinction between themselves and other people, for instance. Uh, infants are able to engage in quite sophisticated imitation. So if you look up studies by uh, Meltzoff, Meltzoff and Moore in the 1970s, uh, if you have an infant who's only a few days old and you make facial expressions at it, then it will try to copy those facial expressions. So it has a degree of control over its own body. It understands how to relate its bodily movements to the movements of other people. It's able to engage in self-initiated actions and so on. Uh, furthermore, of course, both infants and animals have personalities. They have their own unique perspective on the world. Some infants are happy and calm, some mischievous, some are very needy, some are aggressive. So, you know, it looks like there is a at least rudimentary self there. Similarly, consider people with severe memory loss. An interesting example is Clive Waring, a man who had, I think it was some sort of infection, and after recovering he was left with severe amnesia. He lost uh, basically all of his past memories. Uh, for instance, he lost his memory of his, of, of his children. And he's also unable to form any new memories. He can, he can only remember the last... 10 to 15 seconds. Uh, he lives completely in the immediate present. Sometimes he'll start answering a question, but then he'll forget the question he's answering before he's even got to the end of the sentence. There are videos of Clive Waring on YouTube which are really interesting. They're really well worth watching. I mean, it's quite sad, but it's very interesting. Anyway, the point here is that Clive Waring can't tell any narratives of himself. He has no sense whatsoever of existing over time. And yet there still seems to be, again, a rudimentary kind of self, uh, a rudimentary kind of identity. He retains a personality, a sense of humour. He has attachments to other people. Um, he's still attached to his wife, for instance, even though he can't, necess he can't remember marrying her, but he sort of recognises her uh, and he still loves her. He has interests and practical skills such as the ability to play piano. So there's actually still quite a lot of him left. And yet... You know, what can the narrative theory say about this? I mean, certainly Clive Waring's self can't in any, in any respect be a matter of him telling a narrative about himself. A second objection, uh, which I said I would come back to, is the Napoleon problem. So, recall Sheckman's discussion of Vincent. She says that we can reject Vincent's self-narrative on the grounds that it violates the reality constraint. If Vincent claims to be Napoleon, then he must be radically wrong about a number of obvious, easily observed facts. Now, there are two problems here. First, uh, although Vincent may be a little delusional, he presumably still has some sort of personal identity. Vincent has a self. He persists over time. He can remember the past and plan for the future. Yet this personal identity can't be constituted by any narrative he tells, because we've just said that the narrative he does tell doesn't count. So if personal identity is constituted by the, the narrative that we tell of ourselves, and if Vincent's narrative is you know, rejected, then what constitutes Vincent's personal identity? Now, in fact, Sheckman seems prepared to accept that Vincent will be something less than a person. She says that in, in these sorts of cases of extreme delusion, we are, we are actually less inclined to attribute robust persons, robust selves. I'm not so sure about this, um, but... You know, I mean, it seems to me that Vincent may have a kind of distorted personal identity, but he surely still does have a personal identity, right? So I think this is perhaps a bit more of a problem than Sheckman suggests. Uh, now, the second 
uh, problem uh, that is posed by this Napoleon example is, well, I think Scheckman is just wrong in assuming that Vincent must make serious mistakes about reality. I mean, certainly it would be odd for somebody to say that they're Napoleon, but here's a story that Vincent could tell. Vincent might say, well, I was born in 1769. I was named Napoleon Bonaparte. For a time, I was a military leader during the French Revolution, and I uh, rose to fame after a number of successful battles. I engineered a coup in 1799 and eventually became the Emperor of France. I stopped existing in 1821. Then I started existing again in a different body in 1970. For the last 20 years, I've been working as a car mechanic. No soul or spirit or disembodied mind was transferred from the first body into the second one. Nevertheless, I am Napoleon. So Vincent sees the events of his current body in contrast with the events of Napoleon's. His self-narrative involves a rise to power during the French Revolution, death in 1821 and rebirth in 1970, but so far he's failed to attain his former eminence. Uh, he, he interprets his actions and his accomplishments since his rebirth in light of the events of Napoleon's life, and as a result of that he feels rather depressed about his uh, the accomplishments since the rebirth, because obviously nothing accomplished since the rebirth compares favourably to being the Emperor of France. He has fallen very far from his previous power. He looks back with nostalgia at his first love, Josephine, who he, who he married in uh, 1796. He takes responsibility for Napoleon's actions. He feels pride in Napoleon's achievements and shame in Napoleon's failures, and so on. Of course, as noted, nothing persists from the first body to the second. No soul or mind is transferred from, Vincent, uh, from Napoleon's body into Vincent's body. But on the narrative theory, that is irrelevant. The narrative theory says that personal identity is constituted by narratives, not by bodily continuity. And there clearly is some sense in which Vincent is continuing a narrative that started all the way back in 1769, when Napoleon was born. You know, if Napoleon's identity is a narrative, why shouldn't the narrative that Vincent is telling be seen as a continuation of it? Now, one response to this is, well, you know, look, we can show that Vincent's uh, kind of Napoleon narrative is incomplete. If you ask him what he did on the evening of some arbitrary date of which nothing about Napoleon is written in the historical record, he won't be able to answer. Or if he does answer, we'll know he's making it up. So, in fact, there are clear limits to Vincent's narrative, which shows that it's not really a proper narrative. Now, I think this is kind of a, a weak uh, response. I mean, after all, I can't answer similar questions about my past. If you ask me the question, what did you do on the evening of 23rd of June uh, 2003? Well, I, I was alive at the time. I must have been doing something that evening. I have no idea what it was. Uh, my memory of uh, my childhood is extremely poor. Um, I, I, can, I, can, I can recall very little of what I did many years ago, or even last week. I have a very, very bad memory for events in my life. Vincent probably knows more about his past as Napoleon than I know about my childhood. So, that, I think, is, is a problem. I don't think that the reality constraint uh, allows us to rule out Vincent's claim to be Napoleon, um, which, again, is, is absurd, right? We would, not hold, uh, we would not give Vincent praise for the things that Napoleon has achieved, nor would we say that Vincent should be punished for uh, the bad things that Napoleon did, right? It, Vincent isn't Napoleon. Um, it would be ridiculous to... To assume that he was, and so insofar as the narrative theory seems to force us to say that Vincent is Napoleon, there's something wrong there. Okay, a third objection rests on the fallibility of memory. We know that memory is extremely fragile. I'll just note a couple of relevant studies. First, there's a famous study by Elizabeth Loftus and Jacqueline Pickrell called The Formation of False Memories. Loftus and Pickrell presented subjects with three true stories about significant events from their childhood. The, uh, the, the three stories were acquired from close relatives, and there was one fictional story. The fictional story involved being lost in a shopping mall and then being rescued by an elderly man who uh, reunited them with their families. The subjects were asked to read the stories and write down anything else they remembered about the event. About a third of subjects assumed the fictional story to be real and were even able to provide additional details. For instance, they were able to describe what the shopping mall looked like, what the man who rescued them was wearing, and so on. 
Uh, Ira Hyman and her colleagues in uh, the study False Memories of Childhood Experiences used a similar method but repeated the interviews with the subjects. Repeating the interviews increased the number of people who you know, recalled the fictional event. So in uh, one of their experiments, um, zero out of 51 subjects recalled the fictional event in the first interview, climbing to nine in the second and then 13 in the third. So merely repeating the story seemed to increase the number of people who claimed to recall it and increase the chance that they would provide additional details about it. So, I mean, these are just a couple of studies. You can look up more if you're interested in this. Um, but we know that memory is often subject to revision. Now, Galen Strawson has argued that this poses a problem for the narrativist in his article Against Narrativity. Basically, the argument is this. The more you tell a story about yourself, the more that story is likely to be revised. The more a story is revised, the less accurate that story will be. Which means, if we live by telling and retelling stories about ourselves our self-understanding will be increasingly inaccurate. And this is rather troubling. Personal identity requires that we have an inaccurate self-understanding. Can the narrativist respond? I think so. Recall uh, Dennett's point that selves are fictions, they are theoretical abstractions. With this in mind, we should expect the self to involve some degree of simplification and revision. You know, that's what theoretical fictions are for. You simplify in order to make complex phenomena comprehensible. Indeed, revising one's memory arguably might sometimes capture one's deeper character. Consider depression. Depression might lead a person to revise their memories such that they now see past events as being worse than they were. So in a certain sense, they're now more mistaken about the past. But, but these inaccuracies in the memory express a, a kind of deeper feature of their present character, namely their extremely pessimistic outlook on the world. You know, they see their entire life as being misery. So we can see then that revising one's story doesn't necessarily make one's self-understanding less accurate, rather revising the story revises the self. I mean, after all, for the narrativist, uh, the self just is this dynamic developing story, provided the story isn't so inaccurate that it violates the reality constraint, it's it's arguably not really a problem if there are some inaccuracies. So, um, you know, the, the memory argument, an interesting one, I'm not sure it really poses uh, such a problem, but it might be worth uh, thinking about. Okay, a fourth objection that comes from research into situationism, which is a uh, movement in psychology. Um, an excellent discussion of this is in John Doris's book, Lack of Character. It's a really great book, especially if you're interested in ethics. Doris dr draws on uh, situationism to present some uh, really serious challenges to virtue ethics. Um, but we'll see that it maybe also challenges uh, the narrative theory of personal identity. So to sum up situationism in a slogan, what this claims is that behaviour is determined primarily by often seemingly insignificant features of the external situation, not by internal states such as personality, character, moral values, or whatever. Indeed, in its more extreme form, situationism denies that there really are such things as character traits at all. Right? There just are no character traits. Again, that's, that's a more extreme form of situationism. But the, the basic point here is that behaviour determined primarily by the situation. By far the most famous experiment in the situationist tradition is the Milgram experiment. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with it, but it's worth going over the results in detail. So in one version of the experiment, participants believed they were uh, teachers administering memory tests to a learner in another room. The learner was in fact an actor. Whenever the learner got a question wrong, the teacher would have to give them an electric shock, with the voltage increasing by 15 volts for each wrong answer. Here's what the teacher is confronted with. At uh, 150 volts, which the teacher sees is marked as a strong shock. The learner begins screaming in pain and he says he wants the experiment to stop and he mentions he has a heart condition and that his heart is bothering him. He continues uh, screaming and uh, asking for the experiment to stop with each 15 volt increase. Uh, at 330 volts, um, which is marked as an extreme intensity shock, the learner gives and uh, so uh, this is how it's described uh, in the experiment. Uh, 
uh, an intense and prolonged agonised scream, and then he falls silent. Uh, since silence is, in, is taken as a wrong answer, the teacher must continue giving shocks uh, to 450 volts, and it doesn't go any higher. Above 375 volts uh, is marked danger, severe shock. Um, but as I say, the experiment continues to 450 volts, and that, remember, it's 15 volt intervals. So this is a long experiment. This goes on for a long, long time. Now, if the teacher wants to discontinue the experiment, the experimenter will give them a series of four verbal prods. These are, please continue, the experiment requires that you continue, it is absolutely essential that you continue, and finally, you have no choice, you must go on. These are spoken in a uh, firm manner, but not in an impolite or threatening way. Uh, and now, if the teacher continues to refuse after these four verbal prods, the experiment ends. So, as I say, I mean, it's, it's not like they're under a great deal of pressure to continue the experiment, or so one would think, and yet 65% um, of the teachers were completely obedient. 65% of people went all the way to 450 volts. Uh, all of them went to at least 300 volts. They weren't happy about it. They were observed to, uh, and I quote, uh, sweat, tremble, stutter, bite their lips, groan, and dig their, fingernail, dig their fingernails into the flesh. One even seemed to have a seizure. Nevertheless, they obeyed. Fairly striking result. And bear in mind that this experiment was conducted on Americans. America is, of course, known for its rugged individualism and scepticism towards authority, at least you know, more so than other countries. Change the situation slightly, you get rather different results. When the experimenter was absent, giving the orders by phone, complete obedience was 21%. When a confederate um, peer administered the shocks, uh, the, with, with the subject only having to ask a question, complete obedience was 93%. So let's consider a few examples concerning pro-social behaviour. First, Dali and Batson, in their study from Jerusalem to Jericho, told subjects that they were taking part in a study of religious education. Subjects had to fill out a questionnaire in one building and then go to the second building to give a short verbal presentation. They were divided into three groups. Uh, after doing the questionnaire, one group was told that they were on time, the other that they were late, and uh, the, final, the final, fi final group told that they were early. Now, on the way to the second building, they passed a, uh, an actor slumped on the ground moaning apparently in distress. The percentages of each group who stopped to help were 10% um, for the late group, 45% for the on-time group, and 63% for the early group. So pass a person who's clearly in need of assistance, possibly has something seriously wrong, only 10% of people stopped to help just because they were told they were running late for a presentation that didn't really matter that much anyway. Second example, uh, Latani and Rodin, in their study A Lady in Distress, asked subjects to take part in what was ostensibly a study on market research. A young woman gives them a questionnaire to fill out, then leaves. Shortly after she leaves the room, a loud crash is heard and the woman cries out, seemingly in pain. Here the subjects were in four groups. They were either alone, they were with an unresponsive confederate. Um, oh, I should say a confederate is somebody who's like in on the experiment, yeah. Uh, so an unresponsive confederate. Uh, or with uh, another subject who was a stranger, or with another subject who was a friend. The percentages who checked on the apparently injured woman were 70% uh, for those who were alone, 7% for those with the unresponsive confederate, 40% with a stranger, 70% with a friend. Being with another unresponsive person divides your chance of responding by 10. Merely being with a stranger who may or may not be responsive, uh, also significantly reduces the chance of responding. And finally, we know that uh, pleasant aromas have a strong influence on pro-social behaviour. People are far more likely to offer aid in the parts of a shopping mall near the bakery and the coffee shop. And this is shown in a study by Barron called The Sweet Smell of Helping. So this is a very brief overview of situationist research. There's a mountain of studies out there if you're interested. Again, I recommend checking out Don, John Doris's book, Lack of Character. The point is that our personality, our character traits, have far less influence on our behaviour than we usually suppose. So why does this matter? Well, I think that this poses three 
different problems for the narrative theory. First, we're often not consciously aware of uh, relevant aspects of the situation. We might not even notice the quality of the air, for example. And when we are aware of the relevant aspects, when, when we are aware of the quality of the air, only somebody well-versed in the situationist literature would be able to appreciate the influence that these uh, aspects have on her behaviour. So the point is that these situational influences, even though they're a major determinant of our behaviour, they cannot feature in our narratives. Second, even if we were aware of the relevant features of the situation and their influence on our behaviour, it's actually not clear how any narrative could be constructed upon them. So the, the reason is that it looks like the situational, situational influences block our ability to unify behaviour in one circumstance with behaviour in another circumstance by the, the, the sort of non-logical relations that um, were required by Lamarck. As noted earlier, narratives involve placing actions and events into a larger context. You see one event as having some special connection with other events. Recall the example I gave earlier, where I witnessed somebody being bullied, I didn't speak up, and my guilt about this later led me to do the right thing when I was confronted with a similar situation a few years later. On the narrative view, these events are part of a story, a kind of redemption story. I interpret my more recent honourable action in light of my previous failure. If the order of, event, of events were reversed, in the first case doing the right thing and then doing the wrong thing, the story would be something very different. I think the relevance of situationism should be obvious. There is a very good chance that my different actions to the two similar events were not due to any internal states, but were just due to minor situational differences. Had the exact situations occurred in a different order, I would instead have intervened in the first case, but not the second. But, you know, I mean, in a, in a narrative, right, the, se the sequence of events matters. So, you know, the, the, the point here is that it looks like placing my actions into a narrative projects onto them a significance that they probably don't really have. So, finally, I think situationism uh, undermines the use of narratives as tools for predicting and explaining behaviour. The best way to do that is to appeal to features of the situation. Consider the Dali and Batson study. If we want to predict whether or not a subject will help the person slumped on the ground, knowing merely that he has been told that he's running late gives us far more information than his personality, his upbringing, his moral values and so on. Indeed, appealing to these other factors is likely to be positively misleading. You know, while these internal factors they surely have some influence on behaviour, but they're, they're all too often swamped by the situation. Um, I mean, we, you know, there have been, uh, I think, studies of, you know, if, if somebody, say, collapses in the middle of uh, uh, the street in New York in rush hour, nobody stops to help them. Um, it's, you know, very, well, very, very rarely will anyone stop to help them. On the other hand, if you you know, collapse in a a village, um, you know, it just it's a sort of, you know, at noon and there's a few people walking by, they'll stop to help you. But if you're at New York, okay, it's rush hour, people are running late or they're just frustrated because, you know, they've been at, been at work all day or whatever, or they're, or they're trying to get to work, you know, um, they, they will not, they will just not help. And you know, literally hundreds of people will, you know, leave somebody obviously in distress. Uh, so, you know, I mean, and pretty clearly, I mean, of those hundreds of people, um, there are probably many kind, compassionate, uh, helpful people among them. But the, the situation totally swamps those, um, those personality traits. And so, so the point is, is that if you want to explain and predict behaviour, then perhaps these narrative selves are uh, misleading. So uh, that is uh, the narrative theory and some challenges to it. I hope you found that interesting. And that's all for today. Thanks for watching.